She carried out this action behind me. My spouse got a position at the corporate headquarters of a big retail company and moved up the corporate ladder fast. I launched a business and followed my dream of being my own boss in the interim. Unfortunately, the economic slump hit my firm when I was about 27, forcing me to return to the labor. Ever the encouraging spouse, my wife used her contacts to get me a job, especially because we were expecting our second kid and I needed the extra cash. In the end, I worked for my wife's employer, although in a separate division. Since my wife had a head start in the company and I was still finding my footing in the corporate world, at that point, she was making more money than I was. A male coworker and I once had a beer, and he said in passing that he had heard some talk from people in my wife's department. She had a reputation for being flirty at work and was reportedly fairly friendly with the higher executives, even implying that she was being handed about. I was so enraged by this insult that I nearly started a fight. I disregarded it as inebriated rumors, certain that it was merely small-time envy of her quick ascent inside the organization. I had complete faith in my spouse, thinking I understood her the best. I was too gullible and too trusting. I resigned from my work to concentrate on my business once my wife came home from her maternity leave and I became a stay-at-home father. Like any other relationship, ours had its ups and downs, but never once did we see any warning signs or any indication that she might be cheating, much less something more serious. After seven years, she is still employed by the same company, but she has promoted to director. I am a full-time parent who works from home, and we have three children. Even though I only work part-time, my business was profitable enough for our earnings to be nearly equal. I believed we had everything worked out. We had enough money to go on more frequent holidays, but my wife had other plans. For work, she had to be away two evenings a week. I argued that we didn't need the extra money for her to be away from home so frequently and pushed her to spend more time with her family. She argued that her job required her presence and that she had sacrificed too much to simply turn down the opportunity, despite the fact that we had three small children who depended on her. We had this conversation multiple times, and her standard response was that she was hoping to get a promotion that wouldn't need travel the next year. For the previous three years, she has been spinning that yarn. Her defense was that our children can always reach her because they can phone her at any moment. Even though our eldest is just eight years old and doesn't own a cell phone, she used this line of reasoning to avoid her obligations to our children as a mother. We were circling around the same topics, so I would end the conversation. I accepted my position as a father who stays at home full-time and makes an equal financial contribution. Her role in the arrangement was to try to buy her way out of parenting by bringing the kids toys four days a week. Since I actually like spending time with my three children, getting them up from school, and being active in their lives, it didn't really get to me. All I wanted was for my spouse to understand the value of spending time with the children and to quit attempting to wriggle out of things. We probably went to bed once or twice a week on average. Ever since we had our first child, things have been that way. Since I knew that you both had busy lives, it never bothered me. But one day, everything changed when I ran across a former coworker who continues to work with my spouse. We started talking, you know, small stuff. I told him about my wife's demanding job schedule and her constant travels. He and my wife are co-workers in the same department, therefore he is well acquainted with her daily schedule. I sensed something was wrong when I brought up my wife's frequent travel and his response. I realized that if I pressed him any more, it would be unpleasant because we weren't that close. I mentally noted that I will investigate the issue further when I got home. My wife seemed to be hiding something, and my suspicions about her increased. She was always well-groomed for work, so it wasn't obvious. She still wore the same clothes, and our connection from when we first started dating remained intact. The sole distinction was how often she traveled. I decided to look into it more by putting a GPS tracker on her car because I was now a stay-at-home dad. On the day she was meant to be traveling, I saw that she would spend the night at different motels within a 30-mile radius of her place of employment. One day, I made up my mind to check into one of these hotels to see what was actually going on. I hired a babysitter and waited in the parking lot until she and my ex-boss, who was also her co-worker at the time, left the hotel the next morning. That essentially covered the most of my inquiries. Not that they were trying to disguise it. I was absolutely stunned. I hurriedly got out of my car and faced them. They walked out of the hotel as if they were heading off on a business trip. I hurriedly got out of my car and went up to her. I told my former employer to stick put when he attempted to alienate himself. But my ex-boss was able to escape while I was addressing my spouse. My wife was only able to explain that they were attending a business meeting, as though I hadn't just seen her leaving a budget hotel approximately 30 miles from our house at 6 in the morning with a married man. I informed her that our marriage was gone, and she attempted to act as though I was blind. Then it dawned on me that, as it turned out, the rumors that one of my old co-workers had been spreading for the better part of seven years had been true all along. I informed her that she should stay with her partner in the affair and that I had to return home. She eventually moved in with a friend, but she continued to plead to see the children she had been leaving with me while she cheated, and she would not stop messaging or phoning. 
A week or so after I found out about her affair, there were rumors going around that she was seeing numerous men at work, so I was curious to know the whole truth. When we got together, I told her that if she came clean, I might think about taking her back. I wanted to be done with it, but I had no intention of doing so. She refused to talk about it even though I tried, so I decided to look into it myself. At that point, I was positive that, out of the nine men she had married in our nine years of marriage, she was having her seventh affair, six of whom were co-workers. Among these relationships was a protracted one with my previous employer. I was very shocked and heartbroken. I went ahead and filed for divorce, going through the grueling procedure. A few weeks later, we split up. Her cries and begs went unanswered. She made me appear like a complete fool by having affairs with people she worked with on a daily basis, some of whom I knew and who were all married or in committed relationships. I can't get back together with her, no matter how much I apologize. She continues to send me beseeching texts months after our breakup, but I'm over her. The most heartbreaking aspect of this whole ordeal was discovering through a DNA test that my middle child isn't actually mine. My heart was broken, and I'm still not entirely well. She disputed it when I showed her the test results. Both of us took another test, which supported the first findings. I refused to keep her secret, even if she asked me to. I wanted a DNA test for my son, so I wrote to all the men's wives that she had an affair with. Not surprisingly, the majority of their relationships are currently unstable. She ended up quitting her job and deactivating her social media accounts because the story circulated so quickly. I didn't anticipate any of the men to step forward, but none had done so yet. I've maintained a record of the men's names in case he grows up and wants to know who his biological father is, but he's still my son. I'm being really cautious this time around in my relationship with a woman who was once one of my classmates. However, she displays no indications of adultery. Sincerely, I'm happy with how things are going. I make an effort to stay away from my ex-wife and was granted full custody of my three children, knowing that she's sad, that she works in a different sector for less money, and that everyone who knew us understands how she destroyed our marriage is satisfying. I'm now recovering and taking each day as it comes. I've changed into a person I never would have imagined being, but I'm having a great time. The second tale. Although I've never sought professional assistance, every girl I've dated has speculated that I could be a psychopath. It's something that causes me to doubt who I am. I spent months trying to get my girlfriend to be more receptive to the notion of going on a trip that she wouldn't be interested in because I was attempting to get her to go. I made the decision to surprise her one morning by bringing flowers to her apartment. It was a little after 6, 30 a.m., and I intended to prepare her breakfast while she slept. I forced open the lock without a key and let myself in. I discovered her dozing off in her bed with another man when I went into her bedroom to deliver the flowers. I went to the kitchen and took a seat since I needed some time to collect my thoughts. I needed to figure out how much time I had left and identify this individual. I stealthily crept inside the bedroom, located the man's pants, and stole his wallet. I observed that they both had a distinct alcohol odor. I knew she would not wake up till 8 in the morning. M, and I wasn't sure about the person, but I figured I had a few hours based on the smell of alcohol. After going outside to get my laptop out of my truck, I came back into the apartment and took a seat at the kitchen table. I made use of the man's ID, which I had collected to learn more about him. I discovered his Facebook profile and discovered his sister's name, parents' names, and other details. After getting their contact details, I looked up him online and saw that he had a history of possession offenses. I also took a copy of his credit card information. I bought his social security number on the dark web in some dubious places. All this information on my now ex was already known to me. I prepared their breakfasts together. I entered the bedroom while their pancakes were cooking and saw that they were just covered by a thin sheet, fortunately not tangled. After removing the sheet to see them both nude, I snapped some extremely awkward pictures. I went back to the kitchen after that, plated them breakfast, and took a seat at the table to collect my thoughts. After that, I stepped outside and put my laptop inside my truck. I returned to the bedroom with their food and set it down on the nightstand. After that, I returned to the kitchen, took a doorstop from the front door, and moved a chair into the bedroom covertly. I shut and locked the bedroom door, tucking the doorstop beneath a rumpled shirt at the foot of the door. I waited in the room's corner after setting the alarm clock for three minutes to go off. My ex switched it off when the alarm went off, got up, and saw the breakfast. Grinning, she turned to face him and saw that he was still sound asleep. She sat up slightly and appeared perplexed. When she saw me, she said, Oh duck. If she wanted things to go well, I told her she should just sit there and be quiet. She was familiar enough with me to comply, and she nodded while wearing a horrid expression. I told him to get out of bed, move to the other side, stoop down to rouse him up, give him a kiss, and tell him you wanted to introduce him to someone. Inform him that it is crucial that he be silent and stays in bed. She answered in a frustrated tone, but I cut her off and told her to keep quiet and do what I asked or I'll end this conversation immediately. She followed through. When I told her to get back in bed, he turned to face me, still stoned and quite confused. Who are you? He inquired. 
Why on earth are you in this place? Just sit there calmly, I said, and everything will work out. My ex pushed him, telling him to just follow his instructions and pay attention. I prepared you breakfast, I told them afterwards. Consume it. They were both nervous and afraid. The man said, I'm not eating that, as my ex took up the platter and glanced at it. My former partner persisted, just eat it, we have to, despite his objections. They started eating reluctantly, but every mouthful seemed like an excruciating pain. They thought they were going to die and that I had contaminated the meal. They had it in their heads that eating it would be lethal. At last, I responded, all right, that's enough. Go ahead and stop. All they did was set the dishes back on the bed. These are your two options, I told them. I know enough about you both to turn the entire world against you, to leave you without a place to live, and even to make you consider taking your own lives because the lives I can build for you would be too painful to bear. That's the first option, but there's an alternative. As a rational individual, all I ask is to never see you two again. Together, you'll relocate to New Mexico, and I'll give up everything. They looked at one other, but said nothing. Their pants were in front of me, so I took hold of them and returned their phones to them. I advised you to give your employers a call immediately and let them know you were leaving. Turn it on speakerphone first. Inform your supervisor of your impending move and offer your apologies for the short notice. He followed her lead and placed the call. Fantastic, that's resolved, I said. I give up. Jenny, next, give your landlord a call. Inform them that you will vacate the property in two weeks and forfeit your security deposit. Just as she was told, she called. I then told them they had one week to find each other an apartment in New Mexico. I offered to pay their security deposits for their new apartment. I did, however, make it plain that they might suffer a severe consequence if they disregarded my instructions. I described a horrifying scenario in which a family member finds them in the closet, hanging by belts, with humiliating objects inside. It would be a really embarrassing way to pass away. I left them alone after that. In the end, they relocated to New Mexico. I watched them over the next few years using multiple fictitious Facebook profiles. She became pregnant while they were still living together at some point. She left her work about three months into her pregnancy, while he seemed to have secured a nice position for himself. During a trip to New Mexico, I packed a duffel bag with cash, a scale, and nine ounces of powder in individually sealed baggies and put it in his truck. Subsequently, I made anonymous calls to the border patrol and the police, pretending to be a worried citizen who saw his car pick up something unusual at the border. After I got back home, I saw on Facebook a few days later that he had been detained on false pretenses. It turns out that he was sentenced to about 20 years in prison because of his past criminal history and the evidence of his intent to distribute. She ultimately found safety in a women's shelter. She had to make the painful choice to place her newborn daughter for adoption. I've been unable to follow her whereabouts since then. She appears to have vanished entirely, and I have a strong suspicion that she is homeless. Story number three. I chose my wife as my partner and proposed to her in 2020 since we had experienced some difficult times together in the 10 years we were together before getting married. I had worked hard on our relationship, and it was paying off. We had a great year in 2022, a wonderful wedding, and a spectacular honeymoon where we reconnected. We hadn't been successful in our plans to purchase a house by the end of 2022, but we were both happy with our jobs, gaining promotion, and eager to start a family. It turns out that although we thought we were on top of the world, our motivations were different. Our friendship with another couple, whom we had known on a casual basis for a few years prior, deepened in 2019. We grew close to the man and their children because he was my wife's co-worker. When his wife unexpectedly became pregnant during the COVID-19 outbreak, everything changed. That part troubled me the least because my culture is normally touchy-feely, but my wife and guy became very close, texting each other constantly and showing more love than I felt comfortable with. They began spending time together alone, and I became aware of my wife's excessive worry for his safety when we were on vacation, among other things. During our 13-year relationship, my wife and I had always been transparent about our dedication to monogamy, and she had never cheated on me, as far as I knew. We were getting along great, and I had total faith in her. After everyone else had left the celebration, I saw them about to share a private moment. We were all sober, and it was late at night. My spouse demanded that we spend the night at their place, so she made plans to meet him downstairs after leaving our guest room bed. Upstairs was his wife and baby. I was scared of what I would do in my rage, so as soon as I found them, I kicked my wife out and broke off contact with her for 72 hours. Before I could, the partner in the affair told his deceived husband, and she responded similarly. I found out later that week, even before we were married, that this affair had been going on for 1.5 years from the other deceived husband. They were seen hooking up on several occasions, with what appeared to be no intimacy, but I have a suspicion that they are lying and it turned out to be more than simply a misunderstanding between friends. The partner in the affair is one of my best friends, which exacerbates the situation. He supposedly told his wife that I had implicitly consented to the affair when I said that I was pleased that my wife and he had a good friendship. It's completely crazy. I'm in total shock. 
I've gone through all the feelings that many of you have gone through for the past few weeks. After divorcing my wife, I've been drinking, weeping, smashing stuff, and visiting the therapist for weeks. I'm immensely appreciative of my friend's wonderful support. In any case, my wife does appear to be truly sorry. She accepts full responsibility for the injuries and damages that were done. She has been truthful with our friends and hasn't attempted to trick or manipulate me. She despises herself for what she did, but I don't think she truly regrets it given how long this affair continued without her acknowledging it and how traumatizing it was for me to find out. I've made the choice to ask for a separation from my wife and inform her that she must move out for the foreseeable future after much serious thought and difficulty making a decision. I don't think there's a way out of this for us. I find it hard to believe that this is unrelated to me or our connection. I'm unable to support her at this time since she needs to attend to her own personal matters. Now that our relationship is utterly destroyed, perhaps something good can come out of this in the future. It's odd because three weeks ago we were preparing to have children, but now I don't see her as my partner. The situation has deteriorated over the past several weeks. For the previous six weeks, my misbehaving wife had been lodging with friends or relatives. I had stated clearly to her in our final conversation in January that she had to move out, but I had offered to store her belongings in a spare room. She left it there after packing it up. Since then, our sole text conversations have been brief and courteous, sent it only on logistical issues. I sent an email about a month ago asking to arrange our finances, insurance, dogs, furnishings, who would get the house, and other details. I conveyed my wish for a cooperative procedure and stated that all I wanted was to go on, get better, and deal with problems independently. My errant spouse replied to my email three weeks prior and showered me with affectionate messages. After thinking about it for a few days, she texted me to say she was returning home with the understanding that our argument would be resolved and that we would at the very least coexist while we worked things out. She found it incomprehensible that we couldn't just live together. I told her no, quite forcefully, and I was very clear about my boundaries. I scheduled a mediation-based therapy appointment, which has ended as being a godsend. My straying spouse stated that she wanted to make amends and that our bond outweighs the affair. She claimed that despite earning twice as much as I do and living with friends and relatives, she has been wrongfully displaced and left homeless. I told her straight out that I wanted a divorce and that our marriage couldn't work, and the mediator agreed with me. Logistically speaking, I offered her the house we currently rent because I can't afford it. I informed her I'll be moving out in April and that I'm now looking for a new place to live. I'm staying at a friend's house until then since I'm unable to bear the extreme worry that comes with being in our house. We're taking turns taking care of the pets and organizing our possessions now that I think I've found a fantastic house to move into. She became quite upset when I told her that I had notified our landlord that I was leaving and that I wanted a rental reference. She even accused me of trying to get her evicted, which is absurd considering that she can easily afford the house. Last week, she panicked and called me, saying that I was punishing her and leaving her in her time of need. She voiced dissatisfaction and rage at me for discarding things in the house while she was abroad during this week's therapy session. She doesn't realize that I threw away gifts from the betrayed spouse and her affair partner, along with a baby planning book that makes me unhappy right now. Before all of this, we were attempting to conceive. It's astounding. We could have come a long way emotionally, but I keep saying that I have limits. Having a neutral party, such as the therapist, call her out on her delusions and hold her responsible, has been beneficial. But as I had asked weeks ago, she's obviously in a frenzied condition, and I need her help to figure out a budget and go through our separation with respect and grace. But holy cow, she's gone crazy. There is zero empathy left for what she made me go through, it's all about her. Everything that transpired following the revelation of the affair is unrelated to any consequences in her perspective. She perceives it as a string of wrongdoings against her. These therapy sessions aid in providing structure to our conversation, which is essential for my current emotional health. However, it's evident that she takes everything to be directed at her, even in spite of her. I can't wait to get out of here, I'll be moving out in two weeks. I'm scared she won't have any more when I sign another lease, but I'm trying to be patient in the hopes of getting a better, less expensive financial conclusion. Positively, I no longer have any chance for reconciliation before finalizing the divorce because of this entire issue. These are some important details. She attempted to get me to cover the cost of egg freezing, future adoption fees, and her parents' wedding gift while we were negotiating the terms of the financial agreement. She claimed that I had made her homeless and abandoned her when she was in need of mental health help. Despite our agreement to keep the money in our joint bank account separate until after the divorce, she quietly depleted it without my awareness. She casually stated that money wouldn't help me heal when she disclosed this during a scheduled therapy mediation session. Later, when I contacted, our therapist termed her a narcissist and told me to get as far away from her as possible. I tried to keep my new address quiet, but nevertheless she found it and came to my place. When it came to sharing our possessions, she refused to give my cat back to me. She insisted on having my prescription drugs, and because of her addiction, she needed them given to her. She continued calling and harassing me with fictitious phone numbers after I blocked her. 
She depicted herself as someone in need of assistance because of her mental health issue, and she labeled me a coward for leaving her and ending our future together. Yes, it makes sense that after stating everything in such words, my therapist diagnosed me with PTSD. My former partner has been completely cut off from my community since I blocked her on all platforms a few weeks ago. She continues to send me emails on a regular basis, though presumably in an attempt to save her friendships and reputation by persuading me to return to therapy. She updated us with little details about our pet and sends blog entries about how adultery isn't a big issue. Sadly, even though the pet is truly mine, she won't give it to me in complete custody so that we can continue to communicate through mutual errands like pickups and drops. It's been devastating to have to choose between putting my own well-being first and feeling bad about keeping in touch with my ex. Let's talk about me now. I left two and a half months ago. I find ways to divert my attention from my loneliness during the days and weeks that pass when I'm happy with my new life. I attempt to reinterpret it as a feeling of liberation and tranquility. Still, there are times when it gets too much to handle, and I'm hurting and miserable. I feel numb and empty, and I start to wonder what my life's purpose is. Despite the fact that I have a wonderful therapist, a close-knit social circle, interesting interest, and a regular self-care regimen, the amount of pain relief they can provide is limited. I have a tight relationship with the other spouse who was betrayed. We were close friends before this. She is amazing and a bright example of strength that I respect. In many respects, she has emerged as a guiding light in my life. There are still a lot of difficult days, though. She's filed for divorce as well. We had been married for over 12 years when we celebrated our first wedding anniversary a few weeks ago, and it brought back vivid memories of the hurt and grief I had when I first learned about the affair. The unfairness of losing the life and partnership that I'd worked so hard to construct and was proud of has left me feeling overwhelmed, furious, and unhappy. Knowing that she chose to marry me while knowing that I didn't approve of her behavior stings. I'm lamenting the things I've lost. I understand that I still have a lot to give and that my life has possibilities. I'm capable of surviving on my own, but that was never my plan. I still have anguish and heartache on many days. I've tried to work out frequently, and I've seen some weight loss. I focus getting better sleep, see my friends frequently, and spend time outside. I've also looked to medicine to assist me control my anxiety. Although it's improvement, I wouldn't say I'm killing it. Regretfully, I'm still feeling the impacts of the circumstance. I wasn't really satisfied with myself after negotiating on a financial agreement and filing for divorce this week. A tiny sensation of success bubbled up, but it was drowned out by the fear that she would have an intense, erratic reaction. I'm starting to feel the effects of not working at 75% of my potential at work, especially because I work in a tough area. I try not to think too far ahead and to concentrate on the here and now, even though my supervisor is understanding of my circumstances. Sometimes I compartmentalize the anguish, letting go of my personal trauma and trying to see beyond it. To be really honest, though, I'm not sure if this current trajectory in my life and profession is the result of habit, momentum, or true desire. I feel emotionally spent, as like something is obscuring my view and taking away the excitement I once felt for life before everything that has transpired. I can see right through this person's narcissism. Experts have verified it, and I have no desire to make amends with her. It's more of a strong repulsive emotion than a total indifference, I can't say. I'm hoping that eventually I'll become truly apathetic. I've been grieving over our partnership's lost element of intangibility. I have trouble giving it a name, but I feel like something has been taken away, like a pillar or a keystone. Maybe it was the confidence or self-belief in my path and myself that I inherited from someone I loved very much. It's more than just being by yourself. I'm still investigating these emotional wounds effects. I know I'm lucky in many ways, but when I read about other people's achievements, I wish I could be in their shoes. Many people have it worse off than I do. Though it can be difficult at times, I aim to be able to accept myself for not being there yet. I make an effort to think of it as a temporary experience that will soon come to an end. Like comment, I hope the best of success to all of you facing similar obstacles. The road to recovery is a convoluted, difficult one.